I'm Alex Perrine. I'm a staff writer at The New Republic. And I'm Laura Mosh, the magazine's literary editor. Today, we're talking about Joe Biden's cabinet. This is the politics of everything. We are joined now by The New Republic's own Jason Lincolns and Osita Wenevu, two friends of the podcast, to discuss the topic that Americans can't stop talking about right now in mid-November, and that is who will serve in Joe Biden's cabinet. There has been a lot of speculation uh, as we are taping this. No one has been confirmed by the president-elect yet, although that could change by the time you are listening to this. So please keep that in mind. If, for example, we say it's crazy to imagine that he will appoint Michelle Reed to be Secretary of Education, and it turns out we're wrong next week. Uh, (laughs) So people who are the biggest nerds in the world and who don't have hobbies, which I very much include myself, have been doing things like creating fantasy cabinets, putting them on Twitter for everyone to see and to laugh at. (laughs) Have either of you seen any of these that you thought were particularly dire or funny? There's a pollster named David Farrar who tweeted that his dream cabinet included Mitt Romney at Secretary of State, Larry Summers at Treasury, Pete Buttigieg at Defense, (laughs) Michelle Reed at Education, Paul Ryan at Trade, David Petraeus as the Director of National Intelligence. I don't know what this guy's like ideological disposition is. It seems to me you could be like a never Trump Republican or like a centrist Democrat, but I think the general gist of what he's trying to do there is create a team of rivals approach where you have a lot of Republicans, a couple of Democrats, and they're all just going to, you know, work together at a big boardroom table and and solve the country's problems without yielding to ideology and partisanship and blah, 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 you know. And I think that's the way a lot of people think about the cabinet. The sort of opposite of that, which is equally ridiculous, is people who say themselves, well, the cabinet should be everybody who ran in the Democratic primary. (laughs) <laughs> uh, just, just create a roster of, of people. Yeah, exactly. The Avengers. Just create a roster of people that's entirely filled by candidates that we all know and love coming back for like a season finale, you know, from, <laughs> yeah. from the primary. <laughs> this discourse is, is possibly like the, one of the stupidest parts of American <laughs> politics. This is something that like, I think even smart people will engage in having a real understanding of what the cabinet is, or what these agencies actually do. Which is why I sort of enter this conversation with a little bit of trepidation, because I feel like I don't know enough about each and every one of these policy issues to like recommend a particularly good person. Yeah. <laughs> but to go back to the David Farrar, much dunked upon tweet, I think there's something interesting there about forecasting the nature of a Joe Biden cabinet, right? Because Joe Biden is a sort of a unique president-elect of recent years in that he hasn't ruled out bringing Republicans into his cabinet. He sort of played to that ability to reach across the aisle, whether those whether those overtures will be reciprocated is a completely another question. But it's really not clear who Joe Biden might choose for some of these positions because he isn't someone with a really, really clear ideological line. I mean, my expectation is that Joe Biden will tend to favor people who have logged many years in the trenches in Washington and are best known for being collegial. He's thinking about, like, gathering the old guard together to run the show. The notable thing about the speculation that that he'd pick a Republican is that almost by definition, it would be not just an old Republican, but like someone who is years out from having served in office, right? Just because it's hard to imagine current Republicans who would work in a Joe Biden cabinet. I mean, is he going to pick like Josh Hawley? So then, therefore, you have to question the utility of even doing this because you're not reaching out to the current Republican Party. You are reaching out to a past version of it that is now obsolete. We should point out that, assuming he remains Senate Majority Leader, that Mitch McConnell has made it clear that he will try to force Joe Biden to appoint only centrists. So theoretically, any discussion of his cabinet would have to be people who could get past Mitch McConnell, right? I don't know that that we should be expecting Mitch McConnell to do anything but make life as difficult for Joe Biden as he possibly can, no matter what kind of overtures Biden thinks he's going to make. But look, like it's not like Joe Biden was really itching to nominate a a huge number of really progressive people 
to the cabinet. We'll see what actually ends up happening. But it's not like McConnell is somebody who's going to force Biden into nominating a substantially or significantly more centrist cabinet than we probably had reason to expect. I think that was probably going to be the case anyway. What he's actually going to be doing is governing from a position of total consensus. It's the center, maybe slightly center left, uh, Obama consensus is going to revive itself in this administration. And, and sure, he's been pushed in a progressive direction on a couple of fronts, particularly climate. But all of the, the picks we're seeing bandied about, Rahm Emanuel, for Christ's sakes, is being talked about as somebody who might come into the administration. <laughs> it shouldn't be forgotten that Obama, when he came in in 2009, bragged about appointing three Republicans to his mm-hmm. cabinet. I think only two of them ended up getting appointed. But there was this whole song and dance about how, well, it was, it's unprecedented that I'm bringing in all this many people from the other party into the cabinet. And this signals like a new direction we're going to be taking in our politics. I think that's functionally what Joe Biden is going to do here. And it's going to involve the same kinds of looking for moderate and defensive Republicans to fill that vision out. I think it's important to say that one of the people we are talking about, uh, to be specific, and this has been reported by Politico, is Meg Whitman to run the Department of Commerce. Meg Whitman is the former CEO of eBay and Hewlett-Packard, notable most of all for losing an election for governor of California, notable most of all in politics for losing an election, and most recently, the CEO of Quibi, the (laughs) video streaming service that provided quick bites of entertainment uh, until it, in less than a year, just went out of business and closed, having burned (laughs) millions and millions and millions of dollars. And the idea here is that this person should be in charge of the Department of Commerce because she has business experience and (laughs) also that it's safe to put an unpopular failed Republican (laughs) ex-CEO at Commerce because the Department of Commerce doesn't do anything important, right? Like that's the idea that you can park them somewhere like Commerce because – Who even knows what the Department of Commerce does? Well, they are in charge of the census. (laughs) They they run the Patent and Trademark Office. They run the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the National Weather Service. Like, these people have actual responsibilities. So, Osita, what do you think about the way that the actual functions of these departments is ignored in so much of these conversations? I think they're ignored in just about all of them because I don't think that this is a conversation that people come into thinking, well, the person I really want is somebody who's a good manager, right? They want to see their favorite advocates. They want to see their favorite legislators. They want to see people they recognize from TV. They want to see business leaders that they've heard of, whether or not they have a record of actually succeeding in business. But fundamentally, what these agencies do is implement policy. They run programs. There are departments that actually do things in the world. And so you could think to yourself... You know, I like Bernie Sanders or I like uh, any other, you know, progressive politician and, and I agree with their positions. But all of that is sort of separate from the fundamental task of managing a large agency with thousands of people working under you that is actually implementing public policy and doing a lot of very boring things to make sure that the federal government is running properly and doing the things that it's supposed to do. And so that's what makes this conversation a little bit difficult because I think a lot of the people who would be best at that kind of mundane task, which is the central task, aren't people you're going to have heard of? I, for the life of me, don't really know why if you're somebody like Joe Biden and you clearly aren't looking to make sweeping progressive change, I don't know why somebody like that doesn't just go and say, well, who is the undersecretary of this or that under Obama? And let's just promote him up to the next to the next <laughs> room because they know the agency works. They know the ins and outs. They've obviously been capable of managing a large part of it. Let's just bump that person up. But the reason why that doesn't happen is because the political appointments to the cabinet Basically, there, there are two real functions, it seems to me. It's one, you want to signal to some constituency within the coalition that you care about them, even if you don't. And so you can have this token pick demographically or token pick ideologically that signals that this is going to be something that's welcoming to other people in the party. This administration is going to be welcoming to other people in the party. And the other reason is just straight up political patronage. Like these are roles that get given to people who donated a lot or facilitated a lot of donations. And some picks happen that way. Neither of those seem like very good reasons to appoint somebody that the head of a federal executive agency. But that's just how it kind of works. Well, when it comes to that kind of political patronage that you just mentioned, that kind of brings us back to the Democratic primary, right? Because there was an understanding that when... A lot of the moderates dropped out before Super Tuesday that they would be 
rewarded <laughs> in some way. And Kamala Harris has become vice president. But that still leaves, particularly Pete Buttigieg, is being talked about a lot. So do you think that that's one of the reasons that we're seeing so many of these Avengers-style cabinet ideas where it's like Buttigieg, Klobuchar, I've seen Jay Inslee's name coming back up again. There's an element to this that's a lot like sports. I think Osita on Twitter likened it to fantasy football. As a fan of European soccer, I sort of think of this as like like weird chatter that happens when the transfer window is open and like big names are being moved for millions of dollars from team to team. It just feels to me like this kind of like very superficial vibe. And what isn't being talked about is the sort of practical needs the agency has. I think definitely promote the undersecretary. Um, when I think about like the actual needs of the Trump era, what Biden will be left with, he's going to be left with a decimated federal workforce, a huge brain drain. He's going to be left with institutions that have are, are just sort of like the dead hand of what they used to be. So these agencies have been through a kind of brain drain. One of the themes that comes up when we're talking about who might join the cabinet is just taking really talented people who were already in office in other forms of government. So appoint, uh, say, the governor of Washington state to a cabinet position or someone who's already in the House of Representatives or someone who's in the Senate because they're good. The problem here is that drains talent from those other branches of government, right? If someone is really fantastic in the House of Representatives, I'm not sure that's an argument, is it, for bringing them into the cabinet? Because then who fills that role? That's absolutely true. And part of it is also like, the again, the, the skills that are required to be a, a good legislator in the House of Representatives are not necessarily the skills that are required to manage an agency well. But I think the brain drain thing applies to other kinds of posts you'd be drawing people from. My partner is an education sociologist. Um, and so I asked her who she thought would be good at Department of Education. And we had like a very long conversation about this. One of the things she said was some of the people who would be the best positioned given the combination of skills they have to do this would be superintendents of large school districts uh, who, who are doing a really good job in particular cities. But then like you don't want to pull those people out of those <laughs> roles because it's hard to find good superintendents yeah. for large school districts. Yeah, that's a very interesting point because I know I've heard people say, not in any realistic way, but just as wouldn't it be great to have Sarah Nelson, the leader of the flight attendants union, become secretary of labor. And I'm sure she would love to wield that power, but then we would be losing one of the most talented labor organizers currently working in labor organizing in the country because she would now be the manager of an agency. Right. Or another name I've seen come up is well, Katie Porter's brilliant. So she should join the cabinet. Yeah. And I kind of wonder if it would be healthier if those people stayed in the House, for instance, and we could focus more on the House of Representatives and the Senate as being just as important as the presidency when we talk about national politics, because that's where some of the more meaningful stuff is actually going to get done. You should always assume if you really like any particular lawmaker in America, their replacement will not be anywhere near as good at what they do. <laughs> we have a very limited number of successful popular progressive lawmakers and a lot, you know, the ones that we have with power right now, we should work on keeping them there. Well, it's like when you listen to people talking about how they should get promotions at work, right? Something they're often told is, oh, you're too good in your current job. So like the bosses don't want to promote <laughs> yeah. you. But in politics, Sorry. that's literally what we want. If you're an amazing yeah. representative, continue to be that. That's the, yeah. the best <laughs> role that you can fulfill. You shouldn't be trying to get promoted to being like secretary for energy or something. We'll get into the sort of like fantasy football version of our cabinet, but here's my big fantasy about Joe Biden. This is even more pie in the sky than the notion of putting Elizabeth Warren at Treasury. But if we're going to talk about the deep-rooted fantasies about what America could be, to my mind, I think the direction we could burrow in is not looking for this superhero celebrity politicians to run things, but instead head back down to earth and really start picking and choosing among the best that this country has to offer. I think that is a good way to segue into asking who the best this country has to offer is. <laughs> I want to make it clear that, like, 
we are deeply aware that we are uh, mocking the idea of creating a fantasy cabinet while at the same time demanding that our, our wonderful guests create their <laughs> fantasy cabinet. Uh, <laughs> so, Osita, uh, who is first on your list of ideal Biden cabinet members? So the first is somebody who's been talked about, actually, in the Department of, of Labor, Mary Kay Henry, who's the current head of the SEIU, the Service Employees International Union. She's a well-regarded, well-respected labor leader, has been in the movement for a long time. So, you know, she, she'd be um, a pick that would signal a level of seriousness about labor issues to the progressives. She's the capable manager of a large organization. She knows what she's talking about. It hits all the sweet spots for me on, on that position. All right, Jason, uh, tell me one of your fantasy cabinet picks. So when I was thinking about the kind of person that I really wish could be in Biden's ear all the time about the economy, never going to happen in a million years. But the person that I kind of think about right off the bat is Stephanie Kelton, who is currently the professor of economics and public policy at Stony Brook University. And she's the major proponent of modern monetary theory which is a different way of thinking about deficit spending. And it's a thinking that Democrats desperately need to become unstuck in the policy realm. Because right now, whenever someone says, I want to do this big, bold, progressive thing, the first question is, how are you going to pay for it? Just stop answering that question. That we should be deficit spending. Right. So this would be quite a departure from the uh, kind of throwback cabinet ideas that have been floated. Osita, do you have another pick? So this next pick is Jessica Kardashian. She is the director of the Learning Policy Institute's Federal Policy Division at the Department of Education. There's a Bernie connection. She was a Sanders advisor, I think about 10 years ago while in the Senate. She's somebody who seems to think seriously about equity, uh, civil rights, and, and in education. Again, somebody who nobody's really heard of, right. somebody who, who knows the landscape, is engaging already with federal policymakers, presumably would be competent given her previous experience uh, within an organization. I like that pick a lot. And I like that it would be considered an unsexy pick because it's not a person that a normal politics followers have heard of. But it reminds me, there's been some talk recently that Bernie Sanders is angling for himself to be made head of the Department of Labor. And, and I mean... I know Sanders doesn't have all decades left, but do we want him out of the U.S. Senate, really? And that I think that the person he should be pushing for, if he wants to be in a position to have influence over Labor Department policy, he should be pushing for his top advisor to be the head of the Labor Department or his most militant labor issues advisor to go to the Labor Department. And so I like that uh, your pick was indeed a uh, education advisor to Sanders a while ago, which I think like those are one of those sort of good – indications that a certain candidate's head is in the right place on, on issues you care about. And Jason, do you have a final pick? One of the things I thought about really hard before coming on today was about the position of attorney general. I think that there's a lot of different directions you can go in for AG. The attorney general is a very broad remit. But you have to think about maybe signaling what your priority is going to be and who you pick. I'm a little bit biased toward a Department of Justice that works to fight corporate scoff laws. So I would be perhaps inclined to support the candidacy of someone like Barbara Underwood, current Solicitor General of New York. She's fought against big conglomerates. She's done a lot to help mitigate corporate impact on climate change. Someone who's perhaps more interested in reversing the Trump administration's predations on marginalized groups might lean in the direction of someone more like Vanita Gupta, the former acting assistant attorney general for civil rights, the former deputy legal director for the American Civil Liberties Union, has a very good record on prosecuting hate crimes, um, defending people of color. And Biden can give us an indication of where he thinks the DOJ's most important work is going to be under his administration based on the kind of person he picks. So maybe we could add a bonus round because when Alex and I were talking about this show, one thing that came up was a kind of strategic appointment of someone playing on the brain drain effect, but using it to <laughs> your advantage. So we came up with a concept of a spite pick, which would be if there's someone who currently holds a position in the Democratic Party who's just doing a really bad job and you could <laughs> plonk them into a cabinet position where they can't do much, who would that be? I mean, Alex, 
I feel like I should bring you in on this one because you yeah. have a kind of inspired <laughs> idea. Well, I think a lot of people have already made the suggestion that Susan Collins should be appointed to the Biden administration because then her replacement would likely be a Democrat. I would like to see a, a real nice uh, landing spot for <laughs> Diane Feinstein. I really think this is a good opportunity. She's done so much for the party, and I really think Biden <laughs> should try to find a place for her in his administration. <laughs> Any other ideas? My mega fantasy pick is... You appoint Collins to the Department of Homeland Security. She's replaced by a Democrat. You, I guess, use a brain slug on Joe Manchin. This is all assuming the Democrats get the Ossoff Warnock picks. So right. you, you have to get it to the point where it actually will flip the Senate. But you move Collins out of the Senate into the DHS, then abolish the filibuster, then abolish the DHS. <laughs> That's some classic game theory right there. Perfect. Right. <laughs> Straightforward from here. <laughs> Osita, do you have anyone in mind? <laughs> I don't have anybody in particular in mind. I, I am thinking about ambassadorships and how they figure into all of this because that's it's oh, not yeah. cabinet stuff really, but a lot of shenanigans all, you know, always happen with the ambassadorships. In many cases, they seem to go to people with no real knowledge of the country <laughs> that they are going to be <laughs> interacting with and its history and, and the policies there. So if that's what the position is going to continue to be under Biden, you could just throw a lot of democratic leadership in there. Just yeah. <laughs> ambassadors to the Vatican and, you know, Monaco, wherever else. Yeah. I have to imagine there's a lot of uh, people listening who perhaps live in, in large American cities who would not mind it if their mayor were made an ambassador to somewhere or other. Definitely. Bill de Blasio, could, I would be, I would be thr thrilled if Bill de Blasio were, were made uh, ambassador. I would, you know, they, I would like him to be the ambassador to the Netherlands so he can see what a country with a functional urban transportation policy looks like just for the first time in his life. <laughs> Alex, you talked about how one of the big problems we have when we conceive of these things is that all of these agencies really do important things. And so there's no real like place to stash somebody. Maybe we should create a cabinet level agency that's just there to stash people. <laughs> that's just for stashing people. <laughs> like honestly, this, that's, <laughs> this is exactly what you would do in a, in a corporate setting with someone you can't really move. You know, you, people talk about running the government like a business. Well, finding, you know, a safe, dumb place for someone you can't really get rid of but can't do without that is like what a lot of people in the corporate world do right like a department of uh department of new business or a special project <laughs> department yeah. the department of special projects would be perfect and then you i'm the i am the secretary at large for the department of special projects <laughs> exactly okay well i, I think we've got to figure it out all right. Well, uh, it was a, a wonderful conversation, and I'm sure President-elect Biden will be listening very closely. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jason and Osita, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. The Politics of Everything is co-produced by Talk House. Emily Cook is our executive producer. We want to give a special welcome to our new audio engineer, Kevin O'Connell, who's joining us this episode. Thanks for listening. political and social commentary by some of the country's most acclaimed independent journalists, subscribe to The New Republic with our special offer. Get three months of unlimited digital access for $5. You can take advantage of the deal at tnr.com forward slash special offer.